Welcome to Regulatory Ramblings. Our podcast today is brought to you by the University of Hong Kong's RegTech Lab, the HKU SCF FinTech Academy, the Asia Global Institute, and HKU's edX Professional Certificate in FinTech, with support from the university's Faculty of Law. I'm your host, Ajay Shambhasani. Today's discussion centers on the intersection between money laundering financial crime and cryptocurrencies. Since cryptocurrencies first arrived on the scene in 2009, with the arrival of Bitcoin and blockchain, worries have abounded about digital assets and virtual currencies being used for criminal financing and terrorism. To shed light on the matter, we've invited Singapore-based Shingi Ong. She's Chain Alice's head of APAC policy, and it's in the Lion City out of the firm's regional headquarters, we're drawing on Chainalysis blockchain data analytics platform. She works with public and private sector stakeholders to distill developments in digital asset markets and their intersections with global and regional regulatory trends and requirements. Before joining Chainalysis, Cheng Yi spent 13 years at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, holding roles in financial regulation and supervision financial sector development, and central banking. She also served as the advisor to the executive director for Southeast Asia at the International Monetary Fund, advancing ASEAN's positions on international monetary issues and IMF policies. And with that, Cheng Yi, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Very happy to be here today. All right. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, where'd you grow up, uh, you know, a little bit about your professional background, your education, what what, what put you on the path you're currently on? Um, happy to. Thanks for asking that. A little bit about myself, where I'm from. Uh, I'm really from here in Singapore. Uh, I grew up here. You know, Singapore is an immigrant nation. My parents were not from Singapore originally, um, but I was born and bred here. Uh, I became a naturalized citizen when I was in school. You know, a lot of the aspects that make Singapore a good place to grow up the safety, the schools, the infrastructure, I think I really benefited um, from all of that. So it made sense that even though I went away um, for university, that I would then come back and work for the public sector. So I went to the Monetary Authority of Singapore and I spent over a decade there. And as you've pointed out, you know, I've worked across um, multiple different functions, regulation and supervision, um, industry development, central banking, um, so all the all the pillars that uh, MAS encompasses, really. You're currently in the private sector. What was it like being a regulator and see things from that perspective? I mean, uh, the the MAS has a um, renowned and extremely proud and high achieving uh, alumni network. Uh, so, what was it like working for one of the region's foremost regulators? So, MAS is a regulator. Um, it's an integrated regulator, in fact. So it handles regulation and supervision of banks, insurance companies, non-bank financial institutions. And you certainly got a wide array of experiences for given all the roles you held there. Uh, yes. Yes, exactly. So so I think that's the unique thing about the MAS. It's not just a regulator. You know, you've got different sorts of regulatory architectures in different countries. Often you have a separation of functions um, between, say, the central bank and the regulator, between the regulator and the supervisor, or across different sectors. Um, in MAS, you don't just have the regulator for all the um, systemic aspects of the financial system. You also have uh, the central banking function. And I think um, something that is relatively unique um, to, to Singapore, but also perhaps um, is present in Hong Kong, um, is you also have this mandate for financial sector development. So you're regulating on the one hand, you're looking to develop uh, a competitive financial sector on the other, and then at the center of it, you have um, you know, um, the central bank, which is responsible for overall monetary and financial stability. And I think this allows you to have experience that you wouldn't normally get within a single institution. Um, I benefited from that, of course. Uh, I, I worked not just across functions, but also across sectors. So um, I started my career in supervision of capital market intermediaries, you know, broker dealers, 
um, financial advisors. Um, I worked on um, banking sector issues as well, banking sector liberalization, corporate governance. Um, I think that broad range of experience, and that's not uncommon within MES, trains you to optimize across a range of objectives and to think about policy issues in a more holistic or comprehensive way. You know, we sometimes get wrapped up in regulation um, and we lose sight of the fact that it's just one of, I think, a range of policy levers that we have on hand. Um, what do I mean by that? So if the objective that you're targeting is something like banking system stability, uh, then capital and liquidity regulation is one aspect of that. Uh, but access to central banking facilities is another. Um, and then so is creating enough room for a bank to innovate, to develop new and profitable business lines. That's important for sort of its longer term financial position, its longer term prospects. And then if you've got a strong and stable bank, what other kinds of roles can that play in the market? How can it support um, industry development initiatives? How can it support the cultivation of a local talent pipeline? So there is a range of objectives that you can target through a small set of levers, but there's also like a, a wider set of policy levers than, than I think most policy makers um, get to play with in this space. So, you know, you mentioned um, the reputation that MAS has. I think a lot of that comes from training a, a slate of policy makers, regulators, and supervisors and central bankers that by default think in a multidimensional way. You know, it's it's often interested me because I don't think we give enough respect to the people that deal with regulatory policy versus regulatory implementation, regulatory enforcement. Is it important to distinguish between between them or, or how would you distinguish between them and, and what would you say is the importance of regulatory policy? Because that, that involves not just coming up with rules, right? But envisaging their long-term consequences? Often what you have in any institution or in any country is some level of distinction between sort of regulation and supervision. So you'll have often different teams that are crafting the rules, the policy frameworks, drafting the legislation um, compared to the ones that are actually implementing them on the ground. I, I really like to think of this not just not as distinct activities, but rather different points in the same process. They're all interconnected. It's like governance, risk, and compliance, the three tangled threads. They're not necessarily the same thing, but as we keep finding out, you can't have an honest discussion about one without implicating the other two. 100%. And in the regulation and supervision dichotomy, um, Honestly, like it's it's a feedback loop, right? Regulation needs to continue to evolve and then needs to take into consideration what the supervisor has seen on the ground. I've always found um, that if you have a regulator that's spent some time in the supervisory function, um, that helps to in, impart a little bit of discipline in the regulatory policy making because you start to have a stronger um, anchor in terms of what's actually practically feasible, what makes sense um, when it's implemented on the ground. Um, but like really at the minimum, what you need is continual dialogue. Um, and often you'll get, you know, uh, a lot of this activity kind of jumbled up. You know, you'll have like um, certain, like you have teams of supervisors that are involved in the regulatory process or certain types of, um, say, more granular um, standards that are driven out of the supervisory side. I, I think it really is, um, they're not two separate things. Uh, they are um, different parts of a whole and they have to take, be taken as such. Well put. Let's turn to Chainalysis. Now, you guys were innovators in, 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 in your own right. I mean, your credentials, your, your uh, designations, the, the cryptocurrency investigator's license. I mean, others, this isn't to be you know, rhapsodic or overly uh, boastful, but others followed you guys in terms of creating their own or modeling their own designations in, in in those areas, even, you know, the, the famed ACAMS, Association of Maritime Money Laundering Specialists. But since you guys were the first, it's often said, if you want to get credentials in crypto, go go with Chainalysis. So uh, mention that, but also more broadly, what what Chainalysis does. And, and of course, 
you know, when, once you enter the market, once you enter the fray, there's something to be said for being the first mover. But it it has is has it has attracted uh, competitors, and they don't need to be named. Some of which have already appeared on the show. But t- 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 talk to us about that and the education and the services you provide, the state of competition in your field. Maybe to take a step back, the way that I think about it. What Chainalysis really does is help people navigate the blockchain. Um, and you've sketched out, uh, in a way, what, what, what we do as a software company or a provider of services. But at the end of the day, what we provide is actionable intelligence. So public blockchains today, they're completely transparent. Every transaction is visible, but it's not actionable because activity on the blockchain is pseudonymous, right? You've got a bunch of letters and numbers and addresses and timestamps. But if you're int- interacting with an entity or a, or a wallet, you don't know if that's a personal wallet that's controlled by an individual or a centralized exchange or a darknet market. Um, and what Chainalysis does is identify when different addresses are controlled by the same entity. And then we add contextual information that is gathered from off-chain sources um, to help you better understand what sort of entity you're dealing with. Is it a sanctioned entity? Is it a, a licensed exchange? Is it a mixer? Um, so we put all this information together and we think of it as building um, a knowledge graph for Web3. So it's it's a, uh, it, it's a it's like Google for Web3. And we make that knowledge graph available to different clients for different purposes. Um, investigations, risk management, and growth. So at the end of the day, as a company, we provide data, we provide um, software, whether it's risk management or investigative software. Um, We provide services, and that's both sort of like specialized investigative support, um, prosecutorial support, as well as um, a, a wide range of training from the uh, very basic sort of crypto 101 level all the way through to advanced investigative certifications. And then we also do research. Um, and some of that is publicly available. Um, some of that we do on demand. And we provide um, all of this to governments, to financial institutions, to crypto businesses and, and, and to think tanks. Um, and we do that in over 70 countries around the world. So the starting point was to help public and private sector tackle financial integrity challenges. But over time, we've grown um, to, to, to position our data set to more broadly under, help clients more broadly understand blockchain um, and crypto developments. Um, the, the various risks that are um, outside of financial integrity uh, and to consider what the growth opportunities are. So you, you mentioned that you know, we're a market leader in this space. Um, we were sort of the the first to come in and, and start to develop this um, this data set, this software. Um, and I think that is very important to our market position today because if you think about what we're offering, it's a it's a data platform, it's a data product. and data platforms grow exponentially um, more uh, useful, more effective um, the more customers they have. We came in early, we have the most customers, we have um, the, I would say, probably the largest, no, certainly the largest team of um, intelligence analysts gathering all that off-chain data that is required um, to help people make sense of pseudonymous addresses. Um, and I think um, that is that is the, the the value proposition that we offer, the, the, the widest and the most flexible data set to help people understand activity on public blockchains. Okay. You mentioned the number of companies you operate in. Um, do you operate in mainland China and Russia? I, I, I bring it up because I, a recent Bloomberg report mentioned that Russia was now turning to crypto as sanctions start to uh, impede payment. So we operate uh, in a broad range of countries around the world. I mentioned um, 70 countries. They're spread across different regions. We don't operate in Russia or mainland China. Increasingly, we're hearing about something called 
crypto native uh, money laundering. What, what what is it, and then is are our cases rising, or is it just something uh, further on the horizon that we should be aware of? No, it's it's very much uh, in the category of the here and now. So, crypto native money laundering is is our term for. Um, the movement of illicit proceeds from what we consider to be crypto native crime. And why is it so pernicious? It's pernicious for a couple of reasons, right? Like, firstly, it includes um, the proceeds from some of the most, I would say, impactful types of criminal activity that you encounter in the crypto ecosystem. Um, so we think of crypto native crime as things like proceeds from darknet markets, assets stolen from. Um, crypto hacks, uh, payments uh, from ransomware attacks. And these are uh, the types of crimes um, that um, can both have sort of very extensive impacts on individual people. You're thinking about something like child abuse material, or it can also have like extremely um, impactful effects at the nation state level. Uh, so a lot of the assets that we see stolen from um, different types of crypto services, material amount of that can be traced back to activity from state-backed actors, uh, including uh, North Korean hackers. And there is common consensus that um, at least some of those proceeds are used to support uh, the North Korean weapons program. So crypto native money laundering is the movement of funds from a range of what we consider crypto native crimes. And those crimes have significant negative impacts on society, I would say. It's pernicious because it tends to be particularly sophisticated. We see the, the use of a range of different obfuscation methods, things like the use of many intermediary wallets to increase the number of hops, um, make the crypto sort of like harder to trace things like mixers we see used. Mixers, you know, they jumble up the assets of different users together and then they send them out again to try to kind of break the, the flow of funds. Other things uh, that are used, other techniques that are used include the use of chain hopping. So leveraging cross-chain bridges, which are a vital part of, you know, the, the infrastructure of a, a multi-blockchain ecosystem. And, and using those to try to make it, again, a little bit more difficult to trace the funds. So we see different types of um, layering techniques. And I think that's what that's something that's quite notable about crypto native money laundering. And the scale of this activity is significant. You know, since 2019, uh, nearly 100 billion US dollars worth of funds um, have been tracked from known illicit wallets to what we call conversion services, where tainted crypto can be swapped either for another crypto asset or off ramped And obviously these amounts vary over time, but we are talking about large sums. Now that 100 billion you mentioned, does that come from the report on this that uh, Chainalysis produced earlier this summer? Yes, that that does. So we, we produced that report really to try to um, do a deep dive uh, into, um, into how crypto is being used for money laundering purposes, the trends that we see. So that report is available uh, on our website, but it really follows in the footsteps of a lot of the public research that we put out there uh, about the illicit activity that we track on chain. And to be clear, the amount of illicit activity that we can clearly track is a very small fraction of total crypto flows. But you know, the, the volumes in absolute terms, they are still significant. And so we look at both the evolution of um, crypto native crime, as well as in this case, specifically deep dive on the laundering of those proceeds of crypto native crime. But then we also broaden the aperture to look at um, what we call non crypto native money laundering. Well, you've defined crypto native money laundering. How would you then conversely describe non crypto native money laundering? And is it is it a growing concern? You know, crypto native money laundering involves a lot of those um, types of crime that we've commonly associated with the crypto ecosystem and, and blockchain activity, hacks, theft, darknet markets. Non crypto native money laundering um, refers to the laundering of funds from illicit activity that may take place far away from the, the blockchain. What are some examples? So, narcotics, for instance, we've used, uh, we've seen 
um, crypto being used to 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 launder um, funds and also to pay for um, things like fentanyl precursors. Fraud is another big category. The, the the overall message, I guess, that we're trying to drive is that as more financial transactions move on chain, traditional money launderers are also turning to cryptocurrencies to to facilitate their operations. You know, the the UNODC published a paper earlier in the year about the role of online casinos and cryptocurrencies in in the underground banking and money laundering infrastructure, how that can be linked to the financing uh, of transnational organized crime. So we're seeing crypto being used in a wider range of illicit activity. Um, And this is consistent with feedback that we get from law enforcement about um, how they're starting to encounter crypto artifacts more frequently in their investigations. This is a concern. Tracking non Crypto native money laundering can be difficult at scale because, you know, like I said, the illicit activity takes place far away from the blockchain. The, the proceeds are not, you know, natively denominated in cryptocurrency. And so in that context, concrete evidence linking funds to illicit activity is harder to get compared to, to you know, the way that we would track a ransom payment. However, there are certain sort of heuristics that we can apply red flags that we can identify that suggest that this activity is happening. Um, So, you know, like there are certain regulatory reporting thresholds uh, out there, um, like travel rule thresholds, uh, US currency transaction reporting thresholds, and and we can see spikes in the number of transactions um, in sizes that are just shy of these thresholds, suggestive of some level of structuring activity. The, the, this broadening of um, of of money laundering in crypto from crypto native to uh, crypto native crime to all crime really has implications. I think in terms of the the type of response that we need to put forward, um, what this requires in terms of law enforcement capabilities, um, regulatory capabilities, um, the types of monitoring that like crypto exchanges need to do. So it's 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 really um, I think a consequential shift. I'm, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because that leads to my next point, which was: um, Do you think crypto-based money laundering will will get worse in the years to come? So, so I think there are, there are probably two perspectives here, right? The first is you know as crypto activity grows, um, the scale of crypto money laundering will grow. There there are a lot of things already today that make crypto appealing for criminal use. You know, it's it's instant, it's global, it's 24-7, it can be cheap to move around. If you're sending if you're sending um, illicit value offshore, it's probably easier to do so. I mean it's definitely easier to do so um via a transfer of value on the blockchain than by going through some um, you know, correspondent banking or remittance network. But at the same time, you know, liquidity is a vital element for that, especially when you're thinking about moving larger sums of value. And so the more legitimate activity there is, the more you can conceal illicit proceeds in those flows. And so as crypto scales, then yeah, I think, you know, the absolute amount of crypto money laundering will increase. Will it increase on a proportionate basis? That's kind of the question. Like if we're talking about 1% today, are we going to talk about 2% tomorrow? And I think when we talk about that, that that's really an endogenous like question. It That really comes back to how strong our defenses are. You know, one thing that we found is that um, even though a, a lot of illicit flows in crypto, they're going to sort of to, to centralize exchanges potentially for, for off-ramping. Um, over time, we've seen the 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 amount of illicit activity flowing to centralized exchanges declining. And one possible reason for that could be a stronger AML CFT defenses uh, within those institutions. We're also seeing, you know, uh, an evolution um, in terms of crypto AML regulation worldwide. We've already had FATF standards. Um, for a for a long time, for several years now, and those are sort of gradually getting implemented in jurisdictions around the world. And the better we are at recognizing and preventing crypto native money laundering, 
the less it is likely to be appealing as a channel uh, for the movement of illicit proceeds. So yeah, I, I think those are probably the two factors that will uh, determine um, whether and to what extent crypto money laundering gets worse moving forward. Based on all your experience and then the, the literature you've reviewed and the, the research you've had a hand in, in compiling, um, when it comes to crypto crimes, do, do you have a sense of what percentage is linked with Asia and how might that compare with non-crypto money laundering? Um, that's a good question. We don't apportion this activity geographically in a quantitative way. Um, we do spotlight activity in specific jurisdictions when we see it, but we don't do an estimate of like X percent of crypto crime is currently based in mainland China or Southeast Asia or, or the United States. So some of the things that um, we spotlight in, in our latest report are things like the use of OTC brokers as off-ramps uh, in, in China, and that's because we can get intelligence through partners that curate communications on social media and communications platforms like Telegram looking for such activity. Another um, area in which we've spotlighted activity that has a geographical nexus has been in our work on pig butchering. So we, we mapped out flows to one particular scam compound that was located in Myanmar, KK Park. Do you think we should quickly define that for some of our listeners? Pig butchering is a type of scam that uh, typically involves elements of both romance scams and investment scams. So the way that it usually plays out uh, is a scammer will uh, reach out to a, a victim, build a relationship with them. Often they're connected on things like dating apps, social media platforms. You know, I've had, I've had LinkedIn connects that were clearly shady, um, and I'm sure all of us have as well. They will build uh, an emotional connection to the victim while also demonstrating that, you know, they, the scammer, are leading a, a lifestyle of um, means and, and luxury. Um, and at a suitable juncture, they will start convincing the victim to invest in whatever opportunity they've put forward. In our case, we often see that it's some form of so-called crypto platform. And uh, essentially, they will uh, systematically groom and drain the funds of, of victims. And, you know, pink butchering is a common term that is used in the industry. Like, I'm not a big fan. It's, it's, it's quite pejorative. I think financial grooming is probably a, a better term. Well, they're both pretty vile and demeaning. I think big butchering, the common parlance really, the first time we heard of it was around about the time of the global financial crisis when leaked internal documents and memos at some of the um, world's major financial institutions, which will remain nameless, revealed what what people genuinely thought of their clients. There's probably there's no no good name to put on um, in this case a hideous crime. I think, um, but so the the crime itself is deeply personal, right? It has, has such an impact, um, and in a way, it's so um, you would think it's difficult to scale because of the level of investment that it takes to build a relationship with um, with victims. And in, in this case, a lot of the labor that is involved in that process is forced labor. Um, we see the confluence of human trafficking um, and forced criminality. Uh, and even though um, the crime itself seems very personal and tailored to an individual level, it is conducted at scale. Um, and there has been a lot of literature uh, about this. So this is a transnational um, an organized type of criminal activity, uh, often um, perpetrated out of scam compounds that operate in border regions. Uh, there are, you know, scam compounds situated around the world. Um, there are a number in Southeast Asia, of course. And what we can do through crypto is start to try to trace some of these scam related flows to try to get a sense of the scale of of the issue 
Um, and there are two types of flows that we can we can really trace. The first is is of course flows from victims, and the second is ransom payments from the, the say the families and the friends of of those trafficked persons that are held within scam compounds and forced to carry out uh, these scams. And so, uh, in one of our past reports, we've outlined flows to one particular scam compound called KK Park, and and essentially um, sized some of that activity. And we've updated those numbers in um, latest media crime update that we've put out. I'm glad you brought up the topic of asset tracing, because more and more we're hearing about the concept of hot wallets. Um, how does one recover defrauded for, uh, crypto funds to make the victims whole in, in, in that instance? So all crypto is held, um, well, it's really stored, it's recorded on the blockchain and it's controlled through wallets and there are different types of wallets. There are really, there are really two ways that you could seize assets in crypto. Um, the first is where the assets are held by a service provider and you can get the service provider to freeze those funds, to stop whoever owns the account from getting hold off uh, or control over those assets. So for instance, if um, if the assets are held in, in the crypto account uh, of a scammer that has the account held at an exchange with, uh, with the right sort of public-private collaboration, with a subpoena, you could get those funds frozen. Or alternatively, if um, the crypto exchange picks up that the source of funds is likely to be illicit or has suspicions about um, uh, the, the controller of the account, uh, they can also proactively take steps to freeze those funds while they continue to investigate. So that's like the first um, possibility. The second possibility that we have started to see used and that we've actually been involved in some operations with has been uh, the idea of whether certain types of crypto assets can be frozen even while they are held in, in personal wallets, so out of the control of an exchange or another service provider that takes custody of the assets. So, you know, you or I, we could spin up a, a new unhosted wallet, self-hosted wallet, if that's a term that you prefer to use, um, to hold our assets. Technically, you know, the, the wallet is controlled only by us um, and nobody else can, can take control of the assets held within the wallet. However, what we've found is that an increasing amount of illicit crypto activity is denominated in stable coins. Stable coins, of course, are a type of crypto asset that um, have their value pegged to uh, that of a reference asset. And today, um, the, the major stable coins are US dollar pegged. These stable coins are different from other cryptocurrencies because they have a centralized issuer that can take certain steps, including the freezing of, of those assets that are held in personal wallets. And that can be an innovative and potentially remarkably useful tool to effect asset recovery at a distance. So recently, uh, you know, Chainalysis, we were involved in a case where over 200 million US dollars worth of stable coins that were held in personal wallets were frozen. And this was an operation that was undertaken in collaboration with the, the US Department of Justice, as well as OKX. And those funds were linked to, to scam activity uh, and transnational organized crime. And that's, I think, the type of partnership that will be required uh, as we go forward. Now, I mentioned DOJ and OKX, of course, the, the most crucial uh, element of that picture is the stablecoin issuer. And in that case, um, it was Tether. So just, just so that we're clear, are stablecoins actually being used in, in, in money laundering? So the answer is yes, but the broader picture is that stablecoins are just being used in crypto full stop. Over the last few years, we've seen stablecoins play an increasingly important role in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, which makes sense because they're so flexible as an asset, right? You use them um, to swap in and out of, of crypto positions easily, you use them for settlement, you can use them for, for payments. And so today, the majority of all crypto flows on chain are 
are in stable coins. At the same time, um, partly I think because of that growth and adoption, you know, that we talked about earlier, because of the liquidity and the access of stable coins, they are increasingly becoming a preferred vector for the transfer of illicit funds. Uh, and so if we look at just say crypto native money laundering, a majority of um, uh, those illicit flows are also denominated in, in stable coins. And we see that um, specifically in, uh, in particular types of crime or particular types of illicit activity, I should say. So things like transactions with sanctioned entities, things like, like scams, like the, the pig butchering scams that we talked about. Uh, we do tend to see stable coins being used a little bit more um, in those types of activity. But overall, the picture is still, you know, that the growth of stablecoin usage in illicit activity is very much in tandem with the growth of the usage of stablecoins in the broader crypto ecosystem. I'd like to I'd like to turn back to your report because it's made quite a useful primer uh, for a few people wanting to come up to speed on the topic. But are there any other key findings of your report that you'd like to highlight that, that we should mention as key takeaways? Yeah, I think um, I think there are, and it's it's really heartening to hear that the report is useful. I think that's um, why we we put it out as a reference point. There are, I think, a few relevant findings depending on um, what position you're in. But so one is around the the type of obfuscation techniques that we tend to see in crypto native money laundering. So I described a few of them earlier, but the the overall picture is this. Firstly, the use of intermediary wallets uh, remains the most common layering technique. But secondly, we can also see a pickup in illicit flows attributed to mixers and cross-chain bridges. And so essentially what that means is, you know, if you're a compliance officer, it's important to have your transaction monitoring systems tuned so that you can pick up flows that come from mixers from cross-chain bridges. Um, they're not necessarily illicit, but they're probably worth uh, a second look. I think the the second point is is around the concentration within this money laundering ecosystem. We we track illicit proceeds going to different types of conversion services. I mentioned earlier things like gambling platforms, crypto ATMs, DeFi protocols, and so on. So over fifty percent of illicit funds wind up at centralized exchanges, either directly or indirectly, after the use of you know various obfuscation techniques. And that makes sense because, you know, these are these are the most liquid venues uh, offering, you know, certain integrations with the traditional financial system that can be helpful in terms of blending illicit funds with legitimate activities. But like if you are a supervisor, that, of course, provides you with a starting point in terms of where you want to put your supervisory focus in order to get in a way um, the to, to maximize supervisory effectiveness. So, you know, a, a strong focus on um, centralized exchanges, particularly those that offer fiat conversion services, I think is, is, is vital. Come back to your point about how most illicit funds end up in centralized exchanges. Did, did, did you want to elaborate on that at, at all? So I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on which uh, exchanges they are, but I think um, one thing that is useful to think about is the concentration at an even more granular level. So just, you know, we talked about how a large um, share of illicit proceeds are, are going to a small set of centralized exchanges. We can go one step further and we can look at the deposit addresses um, that are receiving those, um, those illicit funds. And there again, we can see a, a good deal of concentration. So in one of the reports that we put out, we, we highlight the, the value of assets that are flowing to the top. 100 deposit uh, uh, addresses that are receiving illicit funds, and and it's in the billions. So in 2023, uh, collectively, the top 100 uh, exchange deposit addresses received over $3 billion worth of illicit cryptocurrency. And what this suggests is that it's not necessarily the exchanges as a whole, um, but perhaps you know, certain nested services that are operating within those exchanges, um, piggybacking off the liquidity that is offered by those exchanges that are responsible for a lot of this of this illicit activity. And so again, that points to um, certain steps that can be taken. So, you know, if you're a compliance officer in an exchange, 
um, enhanced due diligence to identify when a customer is operating as a, a service provider, understanding the nature of that business model, the risks that that poses. Um, all these are, are, are really important steps that can be taken. I think you've done a good job of describing the problem for our audience. I guess that brings us to then one of the best ways to prevent crypto native money laundering. That's the, you know, $64,000 question, right? So, um, you know, crypto native money laundering, we've talked about um, the different obfuscation techniques that are utilized. And often these are, um, you know, elements of, of, of the blockchain ecosystem that offer open access. And it's difficult um, to freeze illicit proceeds at those points. So cross-chain bridges, for instance, they are generally like easily accessible. The best way to prevent crypto native money laundering is to catch it at the, the service provider stage. So, you know, particularly those on and off ramps that we talked about. But ultimately, I think taking a step back to think about money laundering as a whole, crypto native money laundering and the ways to prevent it, like the 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 key pillars of that effort are the same as how we tackle money laundering anywhere else. So we really do need an ecosystem-wide approach here. You know, regulators have a role to play. I mentioned, um, you know, those FATF standards around AML, CFT, risk assessments and risk mitigation measures for virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. Today, the implementation of those standards worldwide is progressing, but it's still very uneven. Um, and given that crypto is a global sector, illicit activity is, is going to migrate to to the weakest links. Um, and that's why we need strong global defenses. We need all regulators to put in place strong AML CFT frameworks for uh, for crypto. At the same time, you know, the private sector, I think, has an important role to play. Crypto asset service providers as sort of like the front line of defense. It is vital for them to have uh, proper risk assessments and and risk management measures. But I also think here that when we're thinking about the crypto ecosystem, you know, there are other elements of the ecosystem that can also play a part. So besides crypto businesses, um, besides the founders of those businesses, you've got, you know, things like the um, the smart money that's funding them, the, the venture capitalists, you've got the financial institutions that are providing them with fiat banking rails. And all of these are, are uh, like types of entities are in a position to conduct due diligence and and to nudge crypto businesses towards a, a stronger AML CFT posture. And then of course, rounding things up, enforcement agencies also have a really important role to play here um, in terms of like tracing the flow of funds, disrupting the money laundering networks that are perpetrating a disproportionate share of this activity. And in order to do that, you know, they need to be resourced, they need to be educated, they need to have the right tools. So it's it's really a whole of ecosystem approach that is required here. And surely it's all hands on deck and a holistic approach is required. But as we look around the region, it's long been said that Asia, obviously Asia is not a, mon not a monolithic whole. You're looking at markets and, and societies and different levels of legal and regulatory sophistication, different different levels of economic and, and financial development. So against that backdrop, how are the region's regulators tackling this issue and what more can be done? So by and large, I think the region's regulators are tackling the issue um, in a way that is consistent with the, the global trend. And, you know, look, even in sort of traditional money laundering, AML, CFT regulation, you know, you, you see this variation across jurisdictions in terms of supervisory capacity, in terms of regulatory capacity, um, in terms of the stage of economic development, the types of risks that they encounter. Um, at the end of the day, the foundational element of any sort of AML, CFT regime is a, is a risk assessment to understand what is the nature of activity, what are the threats, what are the vulnerabilities, what are the risk mitigation measures, and what is the level of residual risk? I think we see that in Asia. So I, I would say, you know, in particular, we have a couple of, of jurisdictions that have traditionally been at the forefront of, re of regulation. And in this case, 
they are at various stages of building out their crypto AML CFT regimes. Singapore, for instance, Singapore was very early in um, in terms of rolling out a regulatory regime for crypto as a whole. By and large, uh, at its early stages, that regime was very much focused on financial integrity risks as well as cybersecurity hygiene. Um, and it was focused on a smaller subset of crypto businesses, particularly sort of uh, fiat to crypto and crypto to crypto exchanges. Singapore has been continuing to build out that regime, most recently in April, uh, when it brought into force amendments that had been made to the Payment Services Act back in 2021. And that, that really had the effect of broadening the crypto regulatory perimeter to scope in players like um, standalone uh, custodial service providers and entities that provide uh, crypto transfer services, even if they don't take escrow. So there is continual work to build out that regulatory perimeter, make it more robust, and also to make sure that it's properly implemented in practice. So we've seen that the Monetary Authority of Singapore has conducted thematic inspections on um, virtual asset service providers and distilled, you know, best practices and uh, common weaknesses that it will be writing up and publishing as guidance. A lot of this work, of course, is timely because Singapore is preparing for its uh, upcoming FATF mutual evaluation. And this will be, you know, the first uh, mutual evaluation where there's a full and thorough assessment of the, uh, not just the technical compliance uh, of a country's like regulatory framework with better standards, but also the effectiveness of that crypto regulatory regime. And so that's that's Singapore. In Hong Kong, I think we saw the authorities move a little at a more moderate pace. So crypto was brought within the AML perimeter with the amendment of the AML ordinance um, in December 2022. And you know the the regime today covers primarily virtual asset trading platforms, and you know there is ongoing work now to extend that out to things like OTC shops, and of course OTC you know covers a very wide range of entities from your brick and mortar kind of like exchange services to large institutional trading desks. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, even beyond. Um, Singapore and Hong Kong, I think we've been seeing efforts across the region. If you think about the Philippines, they've had uh, an AML CFT regime in place for some time. In India, you don't yet have a comprehensive regulatory framework that covers things like consumer protection, but they do have an AML CFT regime and you do have uh, exchanges that are registered with the uh, Financial Intelligence Unit for AML CFT purposes. Obviously, there's still work to be done. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it really does take a global perimeter and not just national ones. And um, there are jurisdictions in the region, Vietnam, for instance, where the status of crypto is still um, not very clear. And so whether and what AML CFT rules apply is still also not very clear. Um, but I think that is an area where there needs to be continual effort. And I think what is um, what is encouraging is that we're seeing international organizations become more active in this space. So the FATF, of course, has always sought to promulgate its standards, not just through um, mutual evaluations, but also through things like capacity development. But we're also seeing institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank become more active in terms of defining what their positions are on crypto regulation and also providing the technical assistance and the educational support to authorities in lower capacity jurisdictions to help them formulate their regulatory frameworks. Uh, and so the direction of travel, I, I think, is good. Good you brought up the FATF, the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force, which uh, for listeners is the global body which sets AML, KYC, and CTF norms and protocols and standards. Uh, how effective is the implementation of the FATF travel rule in, in this space? So the travel rule is the requirement um, for an originator and a beneficiary virtual asset service provider to collect exchange and retain certain customer information every time they process uh, a transfer on behalf of a customer. And 
the goal of it, of course, is to create end-to-end transparency over entities involved in uh, any transaction or any flow of, of funds. And this applies both in fiat as well as in crypto. I would say the travel rule is is one of the most challenging aspects of the crypto regulatory regime today. It's still it's still the area where more progress is required, and this is something that is explicitly called out by the FATF. So there are different levels to this, right? The first is: Are there travel rule requirements in force in all countries? And given that transfers can be cross border, you really do need the same or similar rules to be enforced across all jurisdictions. There, I think we're still um, we're still lagging. There are still quite a number of jurisdictions that have not even introduced um, legislation to this effect, let alone um, started to enforce it. This creates challenges for virtual asset service providers because you may be based in Singapore, for instance, and you may be subject to the travel rule, but you may be interacting with a, a virtual asset service provider that is based in a jurisdiction that is not where the travel rule is not yet in effect. And so what rules or requirements uh, should apply in that situation? This is what we call the sunrise rule, and it's challenging. I think the the second challenge here is um, is is a more practical one, which is question of whether the travel rule solution that you are using, complies with all the FATF expectations. And uh, that is an area where the, the FATF still has some reservations, I would say. Uh, and it's very usefully put out uh, a list of um, considerations that virtual asset service providers should think about when they're thinking about what travel rule solution to provide. So things like, does it allow for the exchange of information concurrent to or prior to uh, the actual transaction on the blockchain? And then um, I guess the the third challenge that the industry is grappling with with regards to travel rule implementation is this question of interoperability. So there are different travel rule solutions providers out there today and that in a way fragments the, the network of communications such that in some cases you may only be able to exchange information using that solution with, like, with, with other um, businesses that are also onboarded with the same travel rule solution. And insofar as that, you know, creates breaks in the flow of communications in the exchange of information, that's of course a, a challenge for this overall goal of end-to-end -end transparency. So travel rule implementation, long story short, challenging, but the industry is working hard on it. And I think regulators are working hard on it. I'd like to come back to something you said earlier about what should the role of regulators be in tackling money laundering? I mean, it seems to me that regulate no, no public official is going to come right out and say this, but regulators are all too often outnumbered, outmanned, out, out, outgunned. Um, so, if we talk about what the role their role should be, I mean, is it they need more manpower? They they need more expertise? They they need they need more technology to aid them. I mean, what? And and, and then, then we come to, you know, what should the role of exchanges, including crypto exchanges and financial institutions, be in, you know, the powers that be have long said, they're gatekeepers. Okay, if they're gatekeepers, then they, they'll tell you that being in the industry, these are the industry best practices. We're applying them. And... Um, the regulators will tell you in a hurry what constitutes bad compliance. They won't tell you what constitutes good compliance. So I, I guess there are insecurities and uncertainties and challenges for both regulators and market participants in, in meeting their roles in this regard. Maybe some degree of private-public partnership is required. So let's flesh that out. What What should the role of regulators be? when it comes to money laundering, and what should the role of cryptocurrency exchanges and financial institutions be? Because my sense from speaking to them is they're doing all they can with, with the resources at, at hand. Uh, there's different aspects to this, to this question, right? So just firstly on regulators, uh, I think you are 
on the nose about the resource constraints that they operate under. Um, All too often, JFIUs, the institutions will file their SARs, STRs, and submit them to the JFIUs. The JFIUs will collect them. Well, what we find is the financial intelligence units, they are heavily overworked. And the problem is they don't connect the dots until the until it's too late. A hundred percent. Like that is that is a challenge. Um, resource constraints are, are always a challenge. We hear this not just with regards to crypto, but this is this is sort of like a, a broader issue, right? And it's a broader issue with, with money laundering as a whole as well. Um, I I think that the the response is to find ways to to make the process more efficient, to do more with less. And the requirements there often would be things like better data analytics tools, tracing tools, uh, investigative tools, education. I think all of these you know, are, are vital. Yes, they need more resources. The industry also needs more resources. Often, you know, this is uh, compliance teams, like you said, they're also operating under extremely tight resource constraints. I think one thing that is encouraging um, is that we've been seeing uh, a lot of crypto businesses start to take AML CFT more seriously and try to resource the compliance functions in uh, a more robust way. You know, we've seen uh, announcements from uh, major exchanges about the extent to which they are bolstering their compliance resourcing. So I think all of that is vital. And of course, it's not just about putting you know, warm bodies on the ground. It's about making sure that they are um, trained and equipped with the right tools to be able to do their jobs. In this space of crypto, blockchain analytics, of course, is is um, one important tool. But there are, you know, there are other things that are also going to be required that are kind of par for the course when we're thinking about money laundering. So understanding typologies, understanding red flags, having access to, to you know, sanction screening databases, Having an automated workflow for that, all of these are ways to try to do a little bit more with less. But um, I wanted to come back to this point that you made about uh, the importance of public-private um, collaboration. And I think that is like very much vital in the crypto space. Uh, we think about collaboration, we think about, um, you know, there are certain things that we tend to think about, like information sharing, and I think that is crucial, but there are different types of information sharing that can happen. I think step one is just um, a very basic level of mutual education. Often, you know, regulators, because of their position, they're not very well placed to to have, you know, market intelligence on hey, what are the latest typologies, um, what does industry know about where, you know, the the, the shady activity is, what are um, uh, different aspects and features of the crypto ecosystem. How does the technology work? All this is information that the private sector can share with regulators that would equip them better to do their jobs. At the same time, what we found is because crypto is relatively nascent, because it's grown up in a relatively unregulated environment, often there is still uh, a gap in uh, in the in the level of understanding of what good governance is, of what good compliance is, um, and of um, both the need and the ways in which you manage various risks and financial integrity is front and center in those. And one of the, I think, really useful things that we've seen regulators around the world do is actively engage the the private sector to make their expectations understood and to to kind of help them better understand the risk landscape um, that they are operating in uh, and the types of steps that they should be undertaking, both as regulated entities and as responsible players in the ecosystem. Um, and that's that's like even a very basic level of dialogue and information sharing that I think uh, would help us create better outcomes in this space. And then, of course, there is more specific um, sharing of um, of information um, that can be disseminated across the industry. So things like, you know, what are the the addresses that are associated with scams? Often, you know, you can see new addresses being spun up really quickly. And so um, sharing information on like which addresses uh, are suspected of being associated with illicit activity and getting that information out across all the other exchanges in the region, that's really time sensitive. 
Um, and of course, once that information is shared, it also provides a basis for further analytics, for detecting networks, for uncovering leads that can be then handed over to law enforcement for further investigation in the hopes of being able um, to get beyond tackling individual crimes to look at the networks that are underpinning those crimes. Um, so that's a very long answer to to your question, but um, more resources, more information sharing, um, is is I think uh, the 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 message at the end of the day. I suppose the revolving door between regulators and the private sector, people becoming regulators entering the private sector, like yourself, and and vice versa, benefits both in terms of the cross fertilization of of knowledge and experience. As you reflect on your all your years of working, all your your lengthy perspective in this field, how have AML regulations evolved in the Asia Pacific over the years? Because there was a time when money laundering wasn't taken all that seriously. It was, if not encouraged, uh, certainly permitted. Uh, a, a, a lax attitude was taken to it. It, it wasn't seen as that big of a deal, that big of a crime, and and then, you know, certainly nine eleven changed things. <laughs> uh, the post two thousand eight, the hyper regulation that ensued, and, and the fines you started to see uh, with HSBC starting in 20, uh, 2011, That that changed things. How has the regulatory landscape changed for AML and financial crime in in APAC over the years? Well, I certainly think it's been taken it's been taken um, increasingly seriously. Um, and part of that is bound to be, you know, linked to this recognition that financial integrity risks, conduct risks, a broader range of risks aside from, you know, capital and liquidity can affect the financial soundness of an institution um, and um, can have a uh, not just a, a a financial impact, but um, also a very impactful um, legal and regulatory uh, effect on on institutions as well as on broader sort of financial systems. You know, we've seen very high profile, very high profile money laundering uh, cases in the region. Uh, things like the the one MDB case. Uh, and those provide real catalysts, I think, and wake-up calls. Uh, maybe wake-up calls is not the right word, but certainly catalysts to drive stronger action in this space. Uh, we've seen um, we've seen this just in terms of the type of resourcing that's allocated uh, to AML uh, within regulators. I've certainly seen this. Uh, in my time in in MAS, you know, when I when I first started there, there was not uh, an AML department, uh, and now and now there is, and they you know invest heavily uh, in building advanced capabilities uh, for the industry and um, and internally uh, to be able to to better detect um, suspicious activity, networks of activity. So certainly, I think in practical terms, we have seen we have seen that shift and that step up in emphasis on money laundering. Sometimes I feel compliance doesn't necessarily get the respect it deserves because the, the claim is, oh, we're protecting you from future fines, future regulatory enforcement actions, reputational loss. But again, that's hard to quantify. Fines seem like a slap on the wrist. The cost of not, they seem to have accepted fines or cost of doing business, at, at least, say, with a department like the tax department in a bank. It's a cost center, but you, you know how much money they saved you, so you can quantify their value. With compliance, it's 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 less so. That, that's why sometimes compliance doesn't get the respect it deserves, even though it's a state-mandated function. You, you've got to have it. How can organizations verify the entities they're transacting and engaging with? So just just to touch on the the first point that you mentioned, because I think it's a it's a very salient point about um, how do you how do you demonstrate value as a compliance team? Sure, yeah, please, please. I, I didn't mean uh, to. No, I think it's uh, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, hopefully, I think the the scale of the 
financial penalties that we've been seeing over the past decade uh, provide a, a sense of what can be. And like when you're talking about numbers in the billions, um, that's no longer pocket change for, for anybody really. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, because it's so, you know, it's so intangible, um, a lot of this really does come down to to, to corporate culture and the, the tone that is set at the top and it has to go all the way up to the board level. Um, so so just that's just on the the issue of compliance. Um, so with regards to the, the your second question, um, that was around how organizations can verify the entities that they are transacting with. Um, I guess there's a couple of aspects to that um, in in the crypto space. Uh, so our so analytics tools like uh, like ours, obviously, you know, we specialize in in identifying businesses on chain, uh, and that means clustering all the potentially millions of addresses that they may have, and then like linking that to a real world entity. So this is Coinbase. This is Binance. Um, so if you see a crypto flow on chain, that's, that's one way, uh, of, uh, understanding who you're dealing with, uh, in terms of your counterparty service provider. Um, and then obviously, uh, the travel rule also, uh, plays a role there in terms of understanding the exact individual or business, um, that, that you are transacting with. Uh, then there is sort of like the unhosted wallet population. Unhosted wallet is is not a great term. Um, there are many other terms. We like personal wallet, um, but self-hosted wallet is also is also commonly used. Um, and there, you know, those those wallets are pseudonymous. There are ways that um, exchanges uh, try to have a little bit more certainty over who's operating the wallet, and that's often by um, you know, requiring that or limiting transfers only to first party transfers. So um, a customer can transfer to a personal wallet that they personally control. Um, and so the direct counterparty for the exchange is known and and you would you would demonstrate ownership and control through something like a Satoshi test um, or signing a transaction or a, you know, through sort of like remote verification. But at the same time, there there is also possible that you'll be transacting with entities that uh, where you 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 don't know for sure who is controlling that address. In that case, even if you don't understand the, even if you don't know with certainty the identity of the person controlling the address, what you can see is the exposure of that address uh, if you have uh, blockchain analytics tools. So you can see, for instance, if the address that you're dealing with um, has done a lot of transactions with other exchanges that are, you know, licensed and have a a, a good um, and robust compliance posture, you could uh, see if you know that address has had a lot of transactions with with darknet markets, with sanctioned entities, if they've received a lot from mixers. Um, so even if you don't know the actual identity of the person that is controlling the address, you can get a sense of the types or the level of financial integrity risk that you would be uh, exposing yourself to when you're undertaking that transaction. Uh, and I think that's kind of what's cool about the blockchain. And that's what's cool about blockchain analytics, that you can sort of get at the substance of risk without necessarily um, relying on um, identity. In the time we've got left, um, is there any advice, any Colonel's wisdom you'd like to impart to uh, the young people, be they our students in the law school, the business school, or you know, if they've got STEM backgrounds either either here or uh, elsewhere, about you know those that might want to enter your profession, that they might see a career path for themselves in, in what you do. What what, what what would you say to them? Um, I would say, uh, I would say definitely do it. Definitely explore it. Right? We are. Should, think, should they study? Should they study law? Should they get a background in computer programming? Is that that increasingly 
there is a need for tech savvy lawyers, tech savvy regulators. What what what's what, what should they do? What should they study? What, what's the right path? What um how how best can they equip themselves for a, a career in, in in a field where law regulation, finance, and technology are increasingly going to collide? I would say, um, firstly, that there is no single right path. Uh, and secondly, that a lot of the learning and the education and the skills building that's going to have to happen is going to happen outside of the um, structured educational environment. Um, and that's just the nature of the economy that we uh, that we live in today, right? Um, the the speed with which it's evolving. I mean, certainly there are skill sets that you can see would be would be useful. Um, I think uh, some some degree of like coding ability, some degree of data analytics capability, they're kind of like just par for the course now. But there are other things that you can get through. Um, you know, the legal training uh, that that you would get in law school that would be extremely useful in this space. I think, you know, it it's what what is really required is not a single skill set and a single educational background, but a diversity of them. Um, and we need those different perspectives to collide in order to try to figure out this question that we have in front of us, which is there are characteristics of the blockchain that make it um, appealing for illicit actors, but there are also characteristics of the blockchain that we can leverage to make blockchain safer. Um, and how how do we tackle that second question? That's going to require, you know, um, an understanding not just of the law, but also of just governance more broadly. It's going to require an understanding of the tech. It's going to require an understanding of what the data tells us. Um, and uh, it, it's highly unlikely that you're going to find all of that expertise within a single person. But we do need to bring all of those skill sets together, maybe lock them in a room, try to figure out uh, what's the, the best way to, to build innovatively and safely. So sign up for Chainalysis Crypto Investigators course and also sign up for the HKU FinTech course. The HKU FinTech course is, is free unless you want the certificate as well, but just sitting through the modules, it's free. Um, it's worthwhile to uh, absorb that knowledge. Just have to put a quick plug in for that, Chingy. Uh, in, in the time we've got left, is, is there anything you feel we didn't cover any Thing, thing you'd like to say to our audience? The the one um, message that I would end with is that this is, uh, in a way, you know, it's it's always going to be an arms race. Um, the, you know, criminals that are operating in crypto, criminals that are looking to, to abuse crypto, they are going to get more creative. And so we need, um, on this side of the line, uh, all the resources that we can get, including all the bright minds of HKU and and you know all the educational institutions around the world, um, to be to be channeled towards this effort. And I think it's a really interesting and dynamic space. Um, and uh, and I would I would encourage uh, students to to get an understanding of uh, of the developments here. Ching Yong, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you. Until next.